cool. So we have Yolka who has been waiting for 50 minutes in a very orthodox Freudian way. Welcome. Just to let you know, um, good morning, London. And uh, just to let you know, there's a uh, to this date, uh, 280, nearly 300 uh, people who have expressed an interest to join the online reading seminar organized by ICLO NLS. Uh, it's a little invention. It's not the only one. We are every day trying to uh, make room for uh, little inventions that uh, allow us to respond to the contingency with something new and not with the same. Hmm? It's one of the definitions of our approach in the Lacanian orientation, how to respond to contingency, not with repetition, but with contingency as well. So it's 11 in Dublin, it's cloudy, there is going to be rain today, uh, as most days, but- you're starting, to, you're starting to sound like the BBC now. <laughs> oh no. Is this the weather forecast? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> that, that could be an alternative career post <laughs> Oh, indeed. We're all, we're all becoming, uh, broadcasters in one way or another uh, through this through this confinement so we're going to start maybe a few more seconds um to welcome uh those who are joining us now we have to allow for the various speeds uh, in technology in various parts of the world. But if you agree, we're going to start by um, not only welcoming everybody, thank you for being there. Uh, it's a time we're connecting and uh, gathering around uh, something of the object to which each of us make a cause in our lives, which is psychoanalysis, is very important. We, we think that it is. And to focus on the work to be carried out um, and to try to get it done. So I am delighted to welcome today our reader and our commentator. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, this online seminar is structured in the following way we read uh, a chapter of Freud's civilization and its discontent. Uh, we all share this moment of following the text to the letter. And we have an invited guest who uh, shares with us uh, some aspect of his or her reading, hmm, a commentary, um, based on his or her own interrogation, highlighting uh, certain aspects of the text. Today, I'm very happy to welcome Raphael Montague. Uh, Raphael is a member of ICLO NLS, um, a very active and committed member of our organization in Ireland. He works as a, a practitioner of psychoanalysis, um, in Ireland, in Dublin, and in various uh, clinical settings. And uh, also, I'm very happy to welcome Thomas Svolos. Thomas Svolos is a member of the Lacanian Compass in the United States of America. Uh, he's a member of the New Lacanian School and the World Association of Psychoanalysis. And I met uh, Thomas uh, quite a long ago, 
um, I remember our encounters in, in person, in real life, uh, in, which happened in Europe um, as, uh, as very, very good encounters, always full of um, curiosity and uh, a rush to share our experiences, um, you know, on both sides of the Atlantic. So I'm, I'm very happy to, to welcome you, Thomas, to this seminar. And I thank you, as well as Raphael, for having said yes to this initiative. Um, we are 126 at the moment. It's five past 11, so we might as well start. Okay. <clears throat> so before I begin to read, just to say thanks very much to Florencia Shanahan for thinking of this as, uh, as an initiative and thanks to the ICLO NLS Bureau for facilitating it and particularly to Linda Clark and to Cecilia Saviotti for doing the tech and the PR and for gathering all of us together here in this, uh, in this cyberspace. So this is chapter four of Civilization and its Discontents. We've had three chapters read previously and we've had some wonderful commentary across a wide ranging wide ranging length and breadth of, of um, psychoanalytic questions and beyond that. Now, this is a relatively short chapter, if memory serves me correctly. And we had said previously that we wouldn't read the footnotes um, because that might bring in some confusion into the reading, but we, we've changed our tack on that and we're going to read the footnotes in this instance. Um, I'm happy about that. I think footnote two, I think there's only two footnotes in this chapter. Footnote two is particularly, is particularly interesting and it's crucial to, to, uh, to the, the real problem that, that Freud is teasing out here in terms of, uh, in terms of um, theories of, of drive maturation into a genital stage and in, in theories of human sexuality generally. So, I begin. The task seems an immense one, and it is natural to feel diffidence in the face of it. But here are such conjectures as I have been able to make. After Prima Man had discovered that it lay in his own hands, literally, to improve his lot on earth by working, it cannot have been a matter of indifference to him whether another man worked with him or against him. The other man acquired value for him of a fellow worker with whom it was useful to live together. Even earlier in this ape-like prehistory, man had adopted the habit of forming families. The members of his family were probably his first helpers. One may suppose that the founding of families was connected with the fact that a moment came when the need for genital satisfaction no longer made its appearance like a guest who drops in suddenly and, after his departure, is heard of no more for a long time, but instead took up its quarters as a permanent lodger. When this happened, the male acquired a motive for keeping the female, or, speaking more generally, his sexual objects near him while the female who did not want to be separated from her helpless young was obliged in their interests to remain with the stronger male. In this primitive family, one essential feature of civilization is still lacking. The arbitrary will of its head, the father, was unrestricted. In Totem and Taboo, I have tried to show how the way led from the family, how the way led from this family to the succeeding stage of communal life in the form of bands of brothers. In overpowering their father, the sons had made the discovery that a combination can be stronger than a single individual. The totemic culture is based on the restrictions which the sons had to impose on one another in order to keep this new state of affairs in being. The taboo observances were the first right or law 
The communal life of human beings had, therefore, a twofold foundation. The compulsion to work, which was created by external necessity, and the power of love, which made the man unwilling to be deprived of his sexual object, the woman, and made the woman unwilling to be deprived of the part of herself which had been separated off from her, her child. Eros and Ananke have become the parents of human civilization too. The first result of civilization Wait one sec. The first result of civilization was that even a fairly large number of people were now able to live together in a community. And since these two great powers were cooperating in this, one might expect that the further development of civilization would proceed smoothly towards an even better control over the external world and towards a further extension of the number of people included in the community. Nor is it easy to understand how this civilization could act upon its participants otherwise than to make them happy. So footnote one, the organic, period the organic periodicity of the sexual process has persisted, it is true, but its effect on psychical sexual excitation has rather been reversed. This change seems most likely to be connected with the diminution of the olfactory stimuli by means of which the menstrual process produced an effect on the male psyche. Their role was taken over by visual excitations, which, in contrast to the intermittent olfactory stimuli, were able to maintain a permanent effect. The taboo on menstruation is derived from this organic repression as a defense against a phase of development that has been surmounted. All of the motives are probably of a secondary nature. See, for example, C.D. Daly, 1927. This process is repeated on another level when the gods of a superseded period of civilization turn into demons. The diminution of the olfactory stimuli seems itself to be a consequence of man's raising himself from the ground, of his assumption of an upright gait. This made his genitals, which were previously concealed, visible and in need of protection, and so provoked feelings of shame in him. The fateful process of civilization would thus have set in with man's adoption of an erect posture. From that point, the chain of events would have proceeded through the devaluation of olfactory stimuli and the isolation of the menstrual period to the time when visual stimuli were paramount and the genitals became visible and thence to the community, and thence to the continuity of sexual excitation, the founding of the family, and so to the threshold of human civilization. This is only a theoretical speculation, but it is important enough to deserve careful checking with reference to the conditions of life which obtain among animals closely related to man. A social factor is also unmistakably present in the cultural trend towards cleanliness which has received ex post facto justification in hygienic considerations, but which manifested itself before their discovery. The incitement to cleanliness originates in an urge to get rid of the excreta, which have become disagreeable to the sense perceptions. We know that in the nursery, things are different. The excreta arouse no disgust in children. And they seem valuable to them as being part of their own body, which has come away from it. Here, upbringing insists with special energy on hastening the course of development which lies ahead and which should make the excreta worthless, disgusting, abhorrent, and abominable. Such a reversal of values would scarcely be possible if the substances that are expelled from the body were not doomed by their strong smells to share the fate which overtook olfactory stimuli after man adopted the erect posture. Anal erotism, therefore, succumbs in the first instance to the organic repression which paved the way to civilization. The existence of the social factor which is responsible for the further transformation of anal erotism is attested by the circumstance that, 
In spite of all man's developmental advances, he scarcely finds the smell of his own excreta repulsive, but only that of other people's. Thus, a person who is not clean, who does not hide his excreta, is offending other people. He is showing no consideration for them. And this is confirmed by our strongest and commonest terms of abuse. It would be incomprehensible too that man should use the name of his most faithful friend in the animal world, the dog, as a term of abuse, if that creature had not incurred his contempt through two characteristics. That it is an animal whose dominant sense is that of smell and one which has no horror of excrement, and that it is not ashamed of its sexual functions. So that's footnote one. Yes, can we check with the participants that the sound is okay? Yes, we have one yes, so we continue. Great. Before we go on to inquire from what quarter an interference might arise, this recognition of love as one of the foundations of civilization may serve as an excuse for a digression which will enable us to fill in a gap which we left in an earlier discussion. We said there that man's discovery, that sexual, genital love, afforded him the strongest experiences of satisfaction and in fact provided him with the prototype of all happiness, must have suggested to him that he should continue to seek the satisfaction of happiness in his life along the path of sexual relations and that he should make genital erotism the central point of his life. We went on to say that in doing so he made himself dependent in a most dangerous way on a portion of the external world, namely his chosen love object, and exposed himself to extreme suffering if he should be rejected by that object or should lose it through unfaithfulness or death. For that reason, the wise men of every age have warned us most emphatically against this way of life. But in spite of this, it has not lost its attraction for a great number of people. A small minority are enabled by their constitution to find happiness, in spite of everything along the path of love. But far-reaching mental changes in a function of love are necessary before this can happen. These people make themselves independent of their object's acquiescence by displacing what they mainly value from being loved onto loving. They protect themselves against the loss of the object by directing their love, not to single objects, but to all men alike. And they avoid the uncertainties and disappointments of genital love by turning away from its sexual aims and transforming the instinct into an impulse with an inhibited aim. What they bring about in themselves in this way is a state of evenly suspended, steadfast, affectionate feeling, which has little external resemblance anymore to the stormy agitations of genital love, from which it is nevertheless derived. Perhaps St. Francis of Assisi went furthest in thus exploiting love for the benefit of an inner feeling of happiness. Moreover, what we have recognized as one of the techniques for fulfilling the pleasure principle has often been brought into connection with religion. This connection may lie in the remote regions where the distinction between the ego and the object or between objects themselves is neglected. According to one ethical view, whose deeper motivation will become clear to us presently, this readiness for a universal love of mankind and the world represents the highest standpoint which a man can reach. Even at this stage, even at this early stage of the discussion, I should like to bring forward my two main objections to this view. A love that does not discriminate seems to me to forfeit a part of its own value, by doing an injustice to its object. And secondly, not all men are worthy of love. So 
The love which founded the family continues to operate in civilization, both in its original form, in which it does not renounce direct sexual satisfaction, and in its modified form as aim-inhibited affection. In each, it continues to carry on its function of binding together considerable numbers of people, and it does so in a more intensive fashion than can be affected through the interest of work in common. The careless way in which language uses the word love has its genetic justification. People give the name love to the relation between a man and a woman whose genital needs have led them to found a family. But they also give the name love to the positive feeling between parents and children and between brothers and sisters of the family. Although we are obliged to describe this as aim inhibited love or affection. Very important sentence. Love with an inhib inhibited aim was in fact originally fully sensual love, and it is so still in man's unconscious. Both fully sensual love and aim inhibited love extend outside the family and create new bonds with people who were before strangers. Genital love leads to the formation of new families and aim inhibited love to friendships. Which became or become valuable from a cultural standpoint because they escape some of the limitations of genital love, as for instance, its exclusiveness. But in the course of development to but in the course of development, the relation of love to civilization loses its unambiguity. On the one hand, love comes into opposition to the interests of civilization. On the other, civilization threatens love with substantial restrictions. The rift between them seems unavoidable. The reason for it is not immediately recognizable. It expresses itself at first as a conflict between the family and the larger community to which the individual belongs. We have already perceived that one of the main endeavors of civilization is to bring people together into large unities. But the family will not give the individual up. The more closely the members of the family are attached to one another, the more often do they tend to cut themselves off from others. And the more difficult it is for them to enter into the wider circle of life. The mode of life in common, which is phylogenetically the older, and which is the only one that exists in childhood, will not let itself be superseded by the cultural mode of life which has been acquired later. Detaching himself from his family home becomes a task that faces every young person, and society often helps him in the solution of it by means of puberty and initiation rites. We get the impression that these are difficulties which are inherent in all psychical and indeed at bottom in all organic development. Furthermore, women soon come into opposition to civilization and display their retarding and restraining influence. Those very women who in, be, in the beginning laid the foundations of civilization by their claims of love. Women represent the interests of the family and of sexual life. The work of civilization has become increasingly the business of men confronts them with ever more difficult tasks and compels them to carry out instinctual sublimations of which women are little capable. Yeah, he really ran himself into trouble with that one. <clears throat> Since a man does not have unlimited quantities of psychical energy at his disposal, he has to accomplish his tasks by making an expedient distribution of his libido. What he employs for cultural aims he, to a great extent, withdraws from women and sexual life. His constant association with men and his dependence on his relations with them even estrange him from his duties as a husband and father. Thus, the woman finds herself forced into the background by the claims of civilization and she adopts a hostile attitude towards it. The tendency on the part of civilization to restrict sexual life is no less clear than its other tendency to expand the cultural unit. Its first totemic phase 
already brings with it the prohibition against an incestuous choice of object. And this is perhaps the most drastic mutilation which man's erotic life in all time experienced. Has in all time experienced. Taboo's laws and customs impose further restrictions which affect both men and women. Not all civilizations go equally far in this, and the economic structure of the society also, influence, it also influences the amount of sexual freedom that remains. Here, as we already know, civilization is obeying the laws of economic necessity, since a large amount of psychical energy, which it uses for its own purpose, has to be withdrawn from sexuality. In respect, Civilization behaves towards sexuality as people or a stratum of its population does, which has subjected another one to its exploitation. Fear of revolt by the suppressed elements drives it to stricter precautionary measures. A high water mark in such development has been reached in our Western European civilization. The cultural community is perfectly justified psychologically and starting by prescribing manifestations of the sexual life of children, for there would be no prospect of curbing the sexual lusts of adults if the ground had not been prepared for it in childhood. But such a community cannot in any way be justified in going to the length of actually disavowing such easily demonstrable and indeed striking phenomena. As regards the sexually mature individual, the choice of an object is restricted to the opposite sex, and most extragenital satisfactions are forbidden as perversion. The requirement demonstrated in these prohibitions that there shall be a single kind of sexual life for everyone disregards the dissimilarities, whether innate or acquired, in the sexual constitution of human beings. It cuts off a fair number of them from sexual enjoyment and so becomes the source of a serious injustice. The result of such restrictive measures might be that in people who are normal, who are not prevented by their constitution, the whole of their sexual interests would flow without loss into the channels that are left open. But heterosexual genital love, which has remained exempt from outlawry, is itself restricted by further limitations in the shape of insistence upon legitimacy and monogamy. Present day civilization makes it plain that it will only permit sexual relationships on the basis of a solitary indissoluble bond between one man and one woman, and that it does not like sexuality as a source of pleasure in its own right, and is only prepared to tolerate it because there is so far no substitute for it as a means of propagating the human race. This, of course, is an extreme picture. Everybody knows that it has proved impossible to put into execution, even for quite short periods. Only the weaklings have submitted to such an extensive encroachment upon their sexual freedom, and stronger natures have only done so subject to a compensatory condition, which will be mentioned later. Civilized society has found itself obliged to pass over in silence many transgressions which, according to its own prescripts, it ought to have punished. But we must not err on the other side and assume that, because it does not achieve all its aims, such an attitude on the part of society is entirely innocuous. The sexual, civil, the, the sexual life of civilized man is notwithstanding severely impaired. It sometimes gives the impression of being in, pro, in process of involution as a function, just as our teeth and hair seem to be as organs. One is probably justified in assuming that its importance as a source of feelings of happiness and therefore in the fulfillment of our aim in life has sensibly diminished. Sometimes one seems to perceive that it is not only the pressure of civilization, but something in the nature of the function itself, which denies us full satisfaction and urges us along other paths. This may be wrong. 
it's hard to decide. Now, so we have footnotes here and I'm going to read them. There's one and two and I'm going to read them together. Footnote one here, among the works of that sensitive English writer, John Galsworthy, who enjoys general recognition today, there is a short story of which I early formed a high opinion. It is called The Apple Tree, and it brings home to us how the present, how the life of present day civilized people leaves no room for the simple natural love of two human beings. Number two, the view expressed above is supported by the following considerations. Man is an animal organ uh, organism with, like others, an unmistakable bisexual disposition. The individual corresponds to a fusion of two symmetrical halves, of which, according to some investigators, one is purely male and the other female. That's Plato. It is equally, impo it is equally possible that each half was originally hermaphrodite. Sex is a biological fact which although it is of extraordinary importance in mental life, it's hard to grasp psychologically. We are accustomed to say that every human being displays both male and female instinctual impulses, needs and attributes. But through anatomy, it is true, can point out the characteristic of maleness and femaleness. Psychology cannot. For psychology, the contrast between the sexes fades away into one between activity and passivity in which we far too readily identify activity with maleness and passivity with femaleness, a view which is by no means universally confirmed in the animal kingdom. Theory of bisexuality is still surrounded by many obscurities and we cannot but feel it as a serious impediment in psychoanalysis that it has not yet found any link with the theory of the instincts. However this may be, if we assume it as a fact that each individual seeks to satisfy both male and female wishes in his sexual life, we are prepared for the possibility that those demands are not fulfilled by the same object and that they interfere with each other unless they can be kept apart and each impulse guided into a particular channel that is suited to it. Another difficulty arises from the circumstance that there is so often associated with the erotic relationship, over and above its own sadistic components, a quota of plain inclination to aggression. The love object will not always view these complications with the, the degree of understanding and tolerance shown by the peasant woman who complained that her husband did not love her anymore since he had not beaten her for a week. The conjecture which goes deepest, however, is the one which takes it from the start what I have said above in my footnote. It is to the effect that with the assumption of an erect posture by man and with the depreciation of his sense of smell, it was not only his anal erotism which threatened to fall a victim to organic repression, but the whole of his sexuality so that since this, this function has been accompanied by repugnance which cannot, be, which cannot further be accounted for and which prevents it complete satisfaction and forces it away from the sexual aim into sublimations and libidinal displacements. I know that Bleuler once pointed to the existence of a primary repelling attitude like this towards sexual life. All neurotics, many others besides take exception to the fact that intra urinus ephesis nasim the genitals too give rise to strong sensations of smell which many people cannot tolerate and which spoil sexual intercourse for them thus we should find that the deepest root of this of the sexual repression which advances along with civilization is the organic defense of the new form of life achieved with man's erect gait against his earlier animal existence. This result of scientific research coincides in a remarkable way with commonplace prejudices 
that have often made themselves heard. Nevertheless, these things are at present no more than unconfirmed possibilities which have not been substantiated by science. Nor should we forget that, in spite of the undeniable depreciation of olfactory stimuli, there exist, even in Europe, people among whom the sexual, among whom the strong genital odors which are so repellent to us are highly prized as sexual stimulants and who refuse to give them up. See, for example, the collections of folklore obtained from Ivan Bloch's questionnaire on the sense of smell in sexual life, published in different volumes of Friedrich S. Krauss's Anthropopathia. Now, that's chapter four. I appreciate your patience. Uh, this English translation of Freud is not the easiest thing for me to read. At times, it doesn't read like English at all. It reads like Scottish. Uh, but what an absolutely fascinating chapter, this chapter four. So contemporary and so backward all at the same time. It's, to me, it's fascinating. These uh, traumas that Freud encounters and these gaps in his knowledge and gaps in his theory. So thank you for your patience in, in listening to me reading. Thank you very much, Raphael. Trying to activate my video um, there. Let's see if that works. Yes. Um, thank you very much for this reading. Um, I find it uh, very interesting that uh, whenever there is an embodiment of uh, the voice of the text, um, there are details that uh, emerge and come to light that one hadn't necessarily uh, gotten the echo of before. So um, <clears throat> with that, uh, I will give the floor to Thomas uh, for his uh, commentary and I will remind all participants that you can um, intervene via the chat uh, or raise your hand um, and we'll have plenty of time today for uh, interventions and questions. Thomas. Uh, I want to thank Raphael for the reading. Um, I want to offer a special thanks to Florencia for the invitation. It, it probably was 15 years ago or so that we met uh, in Europe. I think it would have been at the Rome Congress uh, of the WAP perhaps, long time ago. Um, and I also want to thank Linda and the other colleagues in the ICLU for, for this activity. It is, uh, I would echo, uh, what Florencia said, which is that at a moment of crisis, uh, we are compelled to be creative and invent new things. And, uh, and some of them will probably stick around. I uh, also want to thank the three individuals who preceded me in their discussions and remarks about Freud's civilization and its discontents, which uh, opened up uh, perspectives for me. And in fact, um, I want to start with a, um, uh, it was a question, if I am remembering this correctly, that Roger Litton raised in his uh, discussion as saying something along the lines of, you know, what's important isn't necessarily, you know, what does this text mean, but uh, what use are we gonna make of this text? I mean, what are we gonna do with it? Um, and that has raised for me over the last several weeks as we've met, uh, and as we've gone about this reading, and I'll have a bit more to say about reading Freud in a few minutes. It led me to reflect on the question in a more general sense of 
what use do I make of Freud? What use do I make of Freud? Did I make of Freud over the course of my analysis, for example? What use of Freud do I make in my practice as a psychoanalyst? Um, obviously, Freud created this practice of psychoanalysis, but this was a long time ago. And as I've thought about this question with regard to my own analysis, I felt that, you know, more and more, I would, uh, as my, anal and, and I'm reflecting back to two analyses that the first one began in 1998, so 22 years. As I look over the trajectory of my own analytic experience, I know there were Freudian constructions early in, uh, particularly in my first analysis. But as I think of the last uh, five years of analysis, not present so much, thinking of things in Freudian terms, say, making a construction of one sort or another using Freudian language. Rather, it was Lacan, and in particular for me, as I really explored the very final Lacan, that I kind of found uh, some words that allowed me to say something about my analytic experience. Likewise, when I think of my practice, where does Freud come into play? I'll make one observation. Every now and then, I will see someone in my practice that strikes me as what, uh, the phrase I've used to describe this uh, before is a kind of old fashioned neurotic in the sense that the trajectory of the analysis of this particular person kind of goes along the lines in some way or another of something like the Dora case or the Ratman case. One sees features and the, the things that have stood out to me in that regard are with some, uh, I'll say, old-fashioned hysterics, the, the dialectical reversals that uh, Lacan highlighted about how Freud conducted the case. Oh, I'm a victim, uh, the world is terrible, look at all the bad things that happened to me. And then the moment where you shift, uh, are able to shift something and uh, implicate the subject in his or her existence and suffering and those kinds of things, I've, that'll happen from time to time. Or uh, an old fashioned obsessional where as with the rat man, the, the something about the kind of trajectory of the life story, the, 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 the path that this person has taken through life was uh, somehow written in, in a form of destiny and facts relating to the parental situation, as was the case of the rat man. But this isn't very often for me that I find cases that play themselves out in this way. When we think about dreams, I, you know, Freud describes how he works his dreams in the interpretation of dreams and also in the case histories. This type of methodical way of working with the dream, you know, the element by element, the, the, the focus on the day's residues and so forth and so on. I, I, I for myself, find that's not so much the way I work with dreams now, you know, as if the dream is a deciphering exercise. Angelina Harari is emphasized uh, that 
you know, the issue, there is a meaning dimension to the dream, of course, for sure. But it's the, the use dimension that comes into to play. Uh, and then what about these, all these speculations, you know, Oedipus and Eros and Thanatos and uh, all this other kind of uh, stuff from Freud. I don't find, uh, for myself at least, that that's useful for me in my practice. All right, so then for me, this brings up an even simpler question. What Freud do I read? Because this was an invitation from Florencia to, yes, listen to somebody read the text of Freud. But I took the occasion of this seminar to go back and reread Civilization and its discontents, each chapter prior to the, the meeting. And it occurred to me that uh, it's been several years since I sat down and read a text of Freud from cover to cover. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I can't honestly remember the last time I sat down and read Freud methodically. I go back to pull quotes and notes from Freud when I'm writing something and want to look something up. But I have not sort of sat down with a text like this in a long time. Now, that's not to say I haven't read this before. I've probably read it, uh, I don't know, a half dozen times, uh, along with a lot of other Freud. But most of it was a long time ago. So I don't, it's been an interesting thing to go back and reread Freud. Uh, for people maybe of my age, you know, reading Freud is always rereading Freud. Uh, it's what happens when you get old. <laughs> what Freud do I find compelling? For Lacan, it was very clear. Lacan was, in his sense, uh, many times spoke of his interest in Freud, the discoverer of the unconscious. And in particular, his early texts on dreams, jokes, and parapraxis, where he you know, was in the process of sort of creating psychoanalysis, discovering psychoanalysis, and Lacan was uh, often very critical of the later Freud, the second topology, I think some of the sort of metapsychological dimensions, particularly of the later Freud. But it's very interesting. I went back and looked through the seminars to see what Lacan had to say about civilization and its discontents. And I came across this reference in seminar uh, seven that uh, I thought was particularly interesting and for me sets the context for this exercise. Uh, I believe this might have been the seminar where Lacan discussed civilization more than any other place in his work. And I'm going to read a small passage, a paragraph from Lacan on page six in the English. This civilization and discontents that I invite you to get to know or to reread in the context of Freud's work is not just a set of notes. It is not the kind of thing one grants a practitioner or a scientist somewhat indulgently as his way of making an excursion into philosophical inquiry without our giving it all the technical importance one would accord to such a thought coming from someone who considers himself to belong to the category of philosopher. Such a view of this work of Freud's is widespread among psychoanalysts and is definitely to be rejected. Civilization and its discontents is an indispensable work, unsurpassed for an understanding of Freud's thought and the summation of his experience. 
It illuminates, emphasizes, dissipates the ambiguities of wholly distinct points of the analytic experience and of what our view of man should be. So what, Freud, what Lacan is saying is that we, we should not read civilization as this kind of speculative uh, exercise, a quasi-philosophical type thing, but we, we should read it as having something to say about the analytic experience. So for Lacan in 1959, was it uh, 59, he believed that there was something valuable about the psychoanalytic experience in this text. My question for us is, is that still true today? I'm not so sure. And if, if it is, in what way? For my own sake, I would say this. For me, yes, I agree. The three fundamental texts of Lacan in the early phase about Freud's are interesting. But for me also, the things that were most compelling about Freud were also the letters to Fleece and the uh, Fleiss and the letters to Jung, the correspondence where you can sense Freud grappling with this unknown and trying to make sense of it and, and working his cases and describing them to his colleagues in a very pragmatic way. And I also got that sense uh, reading Beyond the Pleasure Principle, where he's confronted with a new phenomenon and he's, he's really uh, struggling and working on how to make sense of it in the clinical arena. So for me, I don't know. Those, those are more interesting texts to me. But anyhow, let's take Lacan's uh, advice not to treat this as a philosophical text and a text rather that addresses the psychoanalytic experience. What can we say then along those lines? I would say that for me, the significant, uh, one significant thing is the, you know, throughout his work and maybe put together in this text, the, the development of his theory of the libido and the recognition that there's a relationship and a connection between the psychic or subjective dimension of the experience of the libido and the social. This to me is, is uh, a fundamental contribution of Freud, which I think it seems clear to me, and, and chapter four maybe as clear as anywhere else, is organized around the notion of repression. I mean, I think the central uh, fact for Freud is that of repression, and it comes through most clear in the footnotes, and I'll have something to say about that in a second. This is a, a signal contribution from Freud. Uh, the other thing that I think is significant is the, the issue of sexuality really being essentially uh, lawless, uh, to use a Lacanian phrase, or polymorphous, that satisfaction uh, of it is impossible, the experience of that in a sense, and for Freud, all of that linked to repression. What's interest? So, in essence, Freud, and he, uh, there were references throughout the text uh, to you know the essential bisexuality of humans, to the polymorphous perversity, to use his phrase from another text. All of that gets repressed and channeled. He uses this word "channel" in uh, uh, through the fact of civilization. What he does, and I'll say something about this in a second though, that I think is curious, and I'm not sure I believe it, is he hypothesizes an existence of a moment where that was not true. Mm. So if we think about his repressive hypothesis, the hypothesis of repression supposes a moment prior to civilization where 
sexuality was, you know, utopianly wonderful and perfect and people could pursue their polymorphous interests in bisexuality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What about this issue of civilization? Uh, Veronique made a number of comments, which I would endorse completely, that Freud's civilization, first of all, is clearly not our own. We're in a different civilization. And Veronique made a comment, I hope I can remember it precisely, that you know, we're no longer in the so-called repressive time of uh, you know, the Victorian age. We're in a different era. We have new family structures. We have new... Uh, new forms of sexuality that are being explored and they're no longer repressed in the way that they were. Um, the whole social attitude towards sexuality has changed. And, you know, Lacan has taken a number of different uh, uh, approaches to some of the Freudian hypotheses that I won't go into in detail, but, uh, you know, for example, with regard to the drive theory and the notion of Eros and Thanatos. For Lacan, Lacan was one of the few analysts at that moment who accepted the notion of the death drive. But I believe his contribution in, in saying, in essence, every drive includes the death drive, mm -hmm. takes us out of this binary realm into something new and different. Or Lacan's assertion that, uh, in contrast to Freud's uh, belief that the, say, the, 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 dri the drives are always repressed, the libretto is always repressed. Uh, um, uh, no, the drive always finds satisfaction. By the end of his work, Lacan states that the subject is always happy, whether it's happy in a aim, uh, in Freudian terms, in, a, in an aim directed or in an aim inhibited way, it doesn't matter because the, the drive always finds satisfaction. And some of the other comments, uh, more general comments I make before I'll say a few specific things about this chapter, about civilization and its discontents. Freud's discursive world is no longer that of ours. So think about some of the passing comments Freud makes. For example, he talks about these alternative ways of, you know, taking your libidinal energy, and he talks about science. Freud's science has nothing to do with how we look at science now, it's certainly the Lacanian view of science. I, Freud was a positivist. He was a, a, a Comtean in his approach, and he believed that there was going to be gradual and gradual progress in in, in, in discovering things. And uh, uh, at some point, uh, I, I can't remember in which text he talked about how, you know, science will eventually even tackle the mind and biology will figure it all out. This is a view of science that has no relationship with what Lacan has to say about uh, Galileo and the development of modern science and the role of letters and so forth. Uh, the, Lacan's view of science is completely different. Freud, if you go back and read Freud text, Freud's texts on art, you know, great art, great man, he, you know, he pulls these things out of art, it's like eternal truths and so forth and so on. But uh, for me, one of the most interesting things that Lacan had to say about art was in his work on uh, homage à Marguerite Duras, where he talks about how it, the artist in a sense precedes the psychoanalyst in discovering things to say about what's happening in the world, which is a radically different way of thinking about how we might use art in psychoanalysis. Uh, and same, Freud's notion of beauty is no relationship, and I don't want to go into the detail with what Lacan had to say about beauty, for example, in the ethics seminar. All right, what about this chapter? Uh, my first question is, what in the world do we call this? What do we call this kind of <clears throat> speculation 
because it is speculation for me about the past. It's not archaeology because archaeology implies a uh, archaeology implies the study of real objects from the past. I, I think Freud. This is a kind of mythology. Uh, Lacan, if I recall correctly, in Seminar Seventeen, talks about you know Freud spinning myths, and this is a kind of myth that Freud's developing. There's there's something that's unknown, and in fact, it's completely unknowable. We'll never know what happened in the pre-historic uh, era that Freud is uh, is is spinning these tales about, and it. it so in response to an unknown, we create stories that are like uh, myths or fantasies, but you know, myths are social phenom phenomenon. This is almost uh, uh, more like a fantasy on Freud's part, I think of what happened. And you know, what's interesting to me about it is it's a fantasy that implies the existence of a time when uh, the, you know, the sexual relation was possible. I mean, if uh, Lacan says, uh, talks about the non-rapport, the sexual non-rapport, what Freud is, is he's creating a moment where he believed that there existed uh, a sexual rapport between uh, hu in, human, in humanity. Uh, I believe uh, that this uh, says probably more about Freud than it does about what happened, you know, 5,000 or 10,000 years ago in the prehistoric human history. And it reminds me, you know, uh, in a sense of uh, comments Lacan makes in Seminar 20 where he talks about pre-scientific uh, or pre-modern knowledge always includes an inscription of the sexual uh, bond. Uh, and in this sense, Freud is, 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 is hypothesizing an inscription of this at a moment of time. And he does this most clearly in the footnotes. I asked Raphael if it would be acceptable to read the footnotes, because it, it indeed it is in the footnotes that he has some of the most interesting things to to say, and in uh, particularly the final footnote. And I want to reference several specific sentences and make a few comments about it. But I think it's very interesting the existence of these uh, almost mini essays in the footnotes. And it reminded me, going back and reading this text, it reminded me of a, of a comment, which I, I'm gonna read in a second, uh, that uh, 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 Fred Jameson made about the function of footnotes in Adorno's philosophy of new music. He said, um, and it's itself in a footnote, Jameson's comment. This should not, however, be taken as evidence for the presence of two alternating and imperfectly assimilated modes of dialectical thought in Adorno's work. There, on the contrary, an almost physical cause may be said to account for the structural peculiarity of the text in question, which is neither more nor less than a complete footnote. And the abundance, as well as the stylistic and philosophical quality of the footnotes to the philosophy of the new music is itself no accident and has symptomatic value. The footnote in this context may indeed be thought of as a small but autonomous form with its own inner laws and conventions and its own determinate relationship to the larger form which governs it. Something of the order of the moral of a fable or the various types of discretion which flourished within the 19th century novel. In the present instance, the footnote as a lyrical form allows Adorno a momentary release from the inexorable logic of the material under study in the main text, permitting him to shift to other dimensions, to the infrastructure, as well as to the wider horizons of historical speculation. The very limits of the footnote, it must be short, it must be complete, 
allow the release of intellectual energies in that they serve as a check on a speculative tendency that might otherwise run wild on what we will later describe as the proliferation of theories of history. The footnote as such therefore designates a moment in which systematic philosophizing and the empirical study of concrete phenomena are both false in themselves in which living thought squeezed out from between them pursues its fitful existence in the small print on the bottom of the page. So I think these two long footnotes, footnote one and footnote three are significant and I wanna make a few comments. One is the first footnote where Freud develops this whole notion of the importance of the shift from olfactory to visual uh, sexual excitation, the impact of that on anal eroticism that all occurred with the movement to an upright stature and gait, all of which he links to the focus on cleanliness. Uh, for me, this is pure speculation on Freud's part. There, we would never know this. And when I thought about this particular hypothesis of Freud's in the context of the question I raised at the beginning, what use do we make of this? I can't find any use for this, other than to say something about Freud, perhaps. And as one of the persons uh, in this commented on, uh, one of the participants, D-I-B-Y-O, commented, in seminar 17, he classified this Freud notion of the father as a dream and hence worthy of analysis. Yes, I think in a sense, we could think of this as a Freudian fantasy uh, as well and worthy of analysis. However, in the third footnote, there's uh, something very interesting, several interesting comments. Freud discusses the issue of the essential bisexuality. He talks about how anatomy can distinguish between the sexes, but not psychology. He evokes the, uh, the, the traditional sort of, sort of uh, Greek notion of uh, active and passive for male and female. And then he makes a comment that I think is Freud at his best. He says, the theory, and this is a quote from, uh, I read it from the newer translation that is Penguin. Uh, which is a little easier to read. So if you don't have the Penguin translations, uh, uh, I, I, I like them. Uh, they're, they're a little more literary for today's time. Anyhow, he's, Freud says, the theory of bisexuality is still shrouded in obscurity. And the fact that it has not been connected with that of the drives is bound to strike us as a serious flaw in psychoanalysis. To me, this is Freud at his best when he's looking at a problem and he recognizes this in a very, and describes it in a very candid way. And what's most interesting to me about that particular quote of Freud's is that he alludes to the, some of the very points that Lacan, I think, tries to develop through his work with the notion of the objet a, with the formulations of uh, formulas of sexuation that he develops in seminars 19 and 20, with his attempt to find different ways to articulate what we might talk about as the sort of symbolic and the real. Freud sees that this is a problem, how to develop this. And, and my argument would be that in, in, in Lacan's work, we see an attempt to, to, to do to address this very uh, deficit that Freud uh, very honestly uh, speaks to in the footnote. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, you know, this comment uh, from the final footnote where Freud says, the ultimate root of the sexual repression that accompanies cultural progress would seem to be the organic defense of the new way of life ushered in by man's adoption of an upright gate against his earlier animal existence. I mean, throughout uh, the, the text and, and in this particular footnote, including in this passage, Freud alludes to the fundamental importance of repression on civilization and uh, 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 in addition to these kind of speculations about a time when it did not exist. I, 
I would suggest, if we think about the question of what use do we make of this fundamental hypothesis from civilization, it's that we don't make much use of it now. Or, let's put it this way, if, if we follow Jacqueline Miller's comments, we think about psychoanalysis today, we don't think about it from the vantage point of repression. Uh, I'm sure many of you have read these texts that uh, were translated in uh, the Kanyan Review, I don't know, two years ago, the space of a lapsus and the space of a hallucination. And in those very critical seminars of Jacqueline, he speaks about how uh, in the late Lacan, we reach a perspective we are, where we are no longer sort of building psychoanalysis on the basis of repression and uh, drawing from uh, several things, drawing from the Wolfman case and the episode of the severed finger and drawing from um, uh, Lacan's comment on Hippolyte's comments on uh, Freud's negation. Um, Miller develops a hypothesis that in the psychoanalysis that we would create now at the moment of the final Lacan, it's not a psychoanalysis based on repression and the return of the pressed and unconscious formations and so forth, but rather on the hallucination and the existence in the analytic experience of pieces of the real that uh, are not subject to the, the old formulas of laws of repression and so forth. So I think Tom that um, that that's a, that's a point that uh, I would like to to highlight and maybe uh, for the discussion this way of formulating what do we build psychoanalysis on today mm -hmm. it yeah. seems to me very important and and this was my final point in fact, uh, so I, I'm done, but the, I, I wanted to emphasize this, which is, it's, it's, for me, it's a beautiful text to read because it highlights the difference between uh, how Freud built psychoanalysis and how many people are, are using it today, which is in a, in a different way. So with that, I will... Uh, Turn the microphone over to other people. Okay, thank you very much, Thomas. We have uh, we have uh, time to engage our participants, um, and also Raphael, um, also our guest uh, commentators who can be here today with us. Um, there are a couple of questions already that maybe we could we could start with, uh, but uh, yeah, we have two raised hands as well. I'm going to ask Linda to uh, maybe to to um, organize that. Uh, Raphael, would you like to intervene, uh, make a, a comment or? Um. <coughs> Yeah, okay. Uh, th th there's a number of things that, that occurred to me um, in respect to uh, Thomas' commentary. I think at this point in time in Freud's writing, it's 1929, isn't it? Mm. Uh, it, it's, it it's, the, it's the year of the Great Depression, which our current circumstance has been likened to, or at least the proposed economic effects of this uh, crisis we've created via a virus. I, I think at this point in time in Freud's work, yeah, he's a logical positivist, but I, I think his belief in, in that is wavering. I think at this stage in his work, he doesn't believe that logical positivism, positivism is going to come to fruition in the way that the fathers of the Enlightenment had supposed. That given uh, knowledge, technology, education, universities, 
advanced mathematics, advanced science, that man was going to produce a civilization without discontent. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't think Freud believes that at this point in time. Now, but what do you do if, you, if you've built your career in a certain sense as, as a medical professional and a scientist? What do you do? Well, you, you create a myth. Which is, which is a construction in analysis, essentially. Now, we're going, to be, we're, we're going to be publishing, digitally publishing, a very special issue of, of Scriv, which is the editor of the Irish Circle of the Canadian Orientation. Now, I'm not going to give, give the game away on that, no, the, uh, no, because it's, it's, it's an invention that hasn't been announced yet. That hasn't been announced yet. Okay, well, you can take it as, as, as announced there. Exactly. <laughs> so, but what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is say something about how, what it is that Lacan is doing with Freud. You can see in the preface to the English language edition, of seminar 11 which i think is published in in, in english in, in 77 so it's quite late in lacan's career and he adds this this preface in which he says it's probably the most it's the most dense three pages of writing anybody's ever produced and it, it says an awful lot but what he says in respect to reading and rereading freud is very interesting that for him in terms of singularity for the trauma produced in reading freud was lacan's real that's essentially what what he says and in this particular uh, digital issue that we're going to publish i'm going to read one quote from a text that's in it i'm not going to say anything other than that other than read i'm not going to give the game away as we have, but I want to read this particular quote because it really sums up uh, rereading Freud in the Lacanian orientation, in the fullness of that. So I quote, so far from making one concept concord with another, what is at stake is the reconstruction of the point of the real to which those concepts respond, and therefore also the reconstruction of the transformation that this produces. Mm. Right? So that's what Lacan is doing when he's reading Freud. He's, he doesn't, he's not looking to make the whole thing hang together. Mm. He's looking to identify the points of failure, the rupture, the things Freud couldn't get his head around with respect to the sexual relation, for example, things Freud couldn't get his head around with, with respect to logical positivism as, as, as a failed paradigm. So I think that's very important in, in, in rereading these texts. and it, it, It's a very good reason to do it. We are reconstructing something, a point of the real, of an impossibility, something that doesn't work. Uh, it didn't work in Freud's time and it doesn't work today. And I think we're going to see that. We see that down the line with respect to uh, gender fluidity uh, as a solution to binary. We're going to see that's going to come to its limit point uh, 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 at some stage also. And uh, like Freud is remarkably prescient in this particular chapter. He gives a very good description of, of what's going to happen and what did happen with respect to sexuality from you know 1929 up to uh, up to 2019 over over a 90 year period remarkably prescient yeah monogamy is going to going to fail as a societal structure uh different modes of sexual enjoyment are going to come come to the fore this binary of 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 masculine feminine is going to be exposed as not working for us and so on so i think he's remarkably prescient with respect to his social commentary and um also what he's grappling with i think you see there's a very important uh, fragment of a sentence he talks about the, the neurotics and all the rest he's he's grappling with and this is the the last thing i'm going to say i i think He's grappling with 
as a logical positivist that there is no normal. Hmm. The statistical mean that would provide a benchmark for normality is just that, and there is nothing that it refers to. So basically, he's gone to the well and the well's empty, and now he's upset. <laughs> Thank you very much, Raphael. Uh, okay. Very, Thank very you. interesting um, comments. And we have Gustavo de Sal and Roger Lytton. Um, who are uh, going to have their mics open. First Gustavo, Yay! then Roger. And I have two questions. Um, Sihun and uh, three questions. Um, Sihun, um, Marina and Rick. Yeah, so we have five speakers now uh, in line. Gustavo. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Um, hello, uh, Rafael and Thomas. Uh, thank you very much for your reading and comments. Um, Thomas, I find that your initial questions uh, are very interesting. What's the use of this text today? And uh, between the lines, you suggested what's the use of Freud today himself? Hmm. Oh, well, I think it's also a question of taste also. Hmm. Uh, in my experience, uh, I couldn't skip Freud in order to uh, perform my own practice. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would like to, if you allow me uh, a few minutes, I would like to pinpoint at least uh, three in my opinion, three outstanding observations in this text that, uh, in the sense that I find them very, very Lacanian. One has already been mentioned by you, Thomas. Hmm? Uh, the footnote where Freud poses that the biological difference between maleness and femaleness is clear whilst very difficult to establish at the psychological level. Uh, well, in a certain way, of course, we need Lacan to find this. If not, it would have been impossible. But with Lacan, we can say that Freud has, um, well, let's say maybe a naive anticipation of what becomes in Lacan, the thesis of the non-rapport uh, sexual. Uh, the second point is the idea that, for example, heterosexuality as the sexual norm is something abusive, something that imposes, he says, a single kind of sexual life for everybody. I think this is, oh, this is astonishing uh, in that moment, hmm? because uh, Freud adds, and doing so, uh, civilization commits an injustice that is the source of suffering and symptoms. Because I think that the text is, as you say, is, is organized on the basis of repression, but also on the basis of the return of the repressed. Mm -hmm. uh, they, we, we mustn't forget that. Mm -hmm. And the third point, even uh, the prototypical satisfaction admitted by civilization is uh, submitted to forced restrictions. But at the same time, Freud thinks that satisfaction is not only impaired by external restrictions. And this is very up to date. Mm. The idea that uh, what spoils satisfaction is not only the effect of repression. There is something internal in the um, way satisfaction is built up. And th this is a very Lacanian point. Uh, for example, I agree with you absolutely that we have to read this as a myth. 
that's important of the footnote, especially the footnote concerning, <coughs> let me say it this way, concerning shit, hmm? the relationship between shit and civilization. The word civilization uh, teaches us to deal with shit and the way uh, th uh, that dealing is uh, at the same time impossible because shits return every time. And, it, and this is very useful in our clinic because uh, this is very funny. Fred says something that is very popular. Hmm? Uh, we are prone to admit that the other shit smells very badly. Hmm? And that's the way the analysis comes to us, mm -hmm. saying that hmm, in general, is the other shit that smell very badly. And uh, the, condition, the condition, one of the most important conditions to begin to shift that is to make the, 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 the subject uh, begin to think that maybe he has to be aware of the way his own sh or her own shit stinks. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Gustavo. Um, very, very interesting. And there was a question that, two questions that uh, go back to, to the point of um, our relationship to our own shit, to say it like that. Uh, but we'll come back to those questions in a minute. Roger, welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Raphael and Thomas, for all your provocative uh, comments and questions that open up a space where we can think in, say, 3, 3D about some of the things that are going on. This and quite frankly, for this whole project where we hear the text that normally we would read in silence. And I'm astonished by what we hear by reading it aloud. There's something about the history of the cultural history of reading and writing, how the, the articulation between reading, writing, speaking and hearing has changed over, over the years as, a, as a, some kind of, let's say, digital technology of, of writing, where it shifts between the hearing and, and the reading. So certainly hearing something read aloud, to some extent we could say that our, interi our psychic interiority comes from learning to read silently. Whereas before reading aloud was all in the monasteries was always a community activity. There was one text and multiple, multiple auditors. And this is the political role of the scribes and then of the readers and the priests in civilization was precisely the masters that all the way to Luther, Gutenberg and, and Luther. Gutenberg made the text multiple and Luther opened up direct access to the text to each one of us, not having to go via, via the priestly order, the, the masters of the book. So now we have a direct access to the text, each one of us in the reading, but it doesn't mean that something hasn't shifted. And if we, in the 15th century, we went through a revolution in printing in our relation to the text, which led to a religious revolution with the Reformation and the scientific revolution in, we can presume that 500 years later, we are going through another digital revolution of an equivalent magnitude, shall we say with the digital revolution where all the pieces are moving around and whatever the incidental occurrences that we have to deal with, we are seeing a shifting of the tectonic plates, including of the coordinates of subjectivity. Um, that's, that's about hearing the text aloud for a change rather than each one of us in our monastic cell reading in silence in the interiority of our own conscience. That's not what I was going to say, that's, that, that was the preamble. I've got just a, a, another couple of, of, of comments that I, I, I just want to air um, because it provoked by some of the things that, that Thomas said more generally about well, what's, what role for Freud now and what role for this text? How do, we, how do we take on this text? And then more specifically about that fantastic footnote that we won't 
weren't going to read because a footnote is not obviously part of the text. What is the state between the text and the footnote? In this case, well, it, but, but it turns out that the footnote might be the key to the whole, uh, the, certainly to the whole chapter, if not to the whole text. On the question of what use Freud and, and this argument, which is not an early Freud, this is at the end of Freud's, uh, uh, towards the end of his life, a, a substantial clinical experience, immersion in the unconscious. Why is he still so tied, shall we say, to these, these mythical speculations of, of origins in the series of the father, totem and taboo, Oedipus, all the myths? Um, including, shall we say, the myth of the drive. It's, it's really striking to hear Lacan say, not, not just that the death drive, as Thomas said, which he has no use for, but the drive itself as the Freudian mythology. How do we grasp, what, what does it mean to, to put all the drives under, these, under the category of Freudian mythology? Unless it helps us bring into focus, the one thing that is not mythology is castration. So the, the true Freudian discovery is the role of castration. And the mythology of the drives then elaborated around that, that question of castration, including the death drive, elaborated in relation to that notion of castration, which is, is absolutely a contemporary question, is how do we see the death drive played out today in which modalities around the persistent real of castration, whether it takes the form of of the non-report and then the one question thomas referred I, to I the think, non yeah, yeah i think it would be interesting to to let uh, thomas uh, maybe uh, speak to that point uh, it would be uh, i don't know what i would have to say to that because um I think we would have to first develop the question of, in the context, th thank you, Roger. It's, it's a great, great point to make. But in, in the context of civilization, where does castration fit in? So if, 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 uh, if we think about uh, we think about the Freudian laws of repression and the return of the repressed and so forth, is, does castration fit in that? Uh, does castration fit in the, what we could call the sociological hypothesis? I don't, you know, it, Freud, for Freud sometimes it seems to, to, to do that. Uh, what Lacan makes of it, I think, is totally different. I mean, I think, uh, and I'll be curious, if Roger, if you, I mean, uh, if you ask the question, if you might have an answer to it, because it seems to me that with Lacan, it it doesn't come into play in the in the issue of repression and the return of the pressed and so forth. It doesn't come into play with the with as a societal phenomenon, you know, Lacan always makes fun of the, you know, you know, Papa's going to cut up your cut off your little wee wee notion of castration. But for Lacan, I think it's a it's a fact of language, and that doesn't. You know. In a way, Thomas, this is um, this can be linked to this point you made about what do we build psychoanalysis on today. Yeah. Because there is no doubt, and I think perhaps Roger was pointing towards that as well, that for the practice that psychoanalysis is, for the praxis as defined by Lacan uh, as, a, as a way of intervening in the real or on the real by means of the symbolic, there is no doubt that clinically we face an era where the unconscious as such and where desire as an effect of castration doesn't present itself as an evidence or an obvious thing in our everyday clinic. And that in any case, 
that uh, brings us back to what was discussed by some of our commentators before, which is uh, the uh, dialectic or lack of between the place of uh, the ideal, the place of the symbolic and the, the predominancy of the object. Hmm? The, uh, so, uh, castration is a name for what Lacan calls the divided subject. And what uh, Gustavo pointed towards was there is an operation that uh, is no, no longer a given in, because of certain changes in our, uh, um, in our world. It's no longer a given that uh, there is a relationship uh, of the subject to himself that is based on division, hmm? on castration, and that that is, uh, puts us uh, with the responsibility to question and elaborate what do we base, what do we build psychoanalysis on, if it's not that we think psychoanalysis is a theory that we impose and with which we go previously with our theory to listen to the people who come to us. If it's the other way around, then uh, I think this finds um, this discussion finds its proper place. So I'm going to uh, give uh, the, the the voice to some of the questions. Yeah, we have still uh, some time, about 20, 25 minutes, but we have at least five questions. And um, the first one is, how should we understand? This is by Sihun Shen. How should we understand the fact? that it's becoming more popular for people to watch live streaming of feces eating when it's separated from the sense of smell. From my research, this feces eating has not much to do with eating feces as eroticism or masochism, but the public exhibition of being recognized as someone who eats feces. What are your thoughts on the live streaming of feces eating, considering that it's related to anal eroticism, but different from it? Yeah. I didn't know this existed, I, sorry. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't know it existed either, but I would question, I mean, I guess my first, and I think uh, Florencia alluded to it, or maybe it was in the question itself. I think the issue is, does watching someone eating feces have anything to do with anal eroticism? That's not obvious to me at all. I mean, it could be something else that's in play and you don't know what it is. And I don't think you can speak about it without being under transference. You would need an analysand in front of you on the couch in a chair talking about their interest in watching such videos or live streaming and to be able to make sense of it. Because the, you know, the interesting thing uh, to me is that, uh, 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 the, you know, if we're going to use this old sort of drive type language, that uh, just because feces is involved doesn't necessarily mean it has anything to do with anal drive. It, 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 the, I, I, I agree. <laughs> and I'll give a, I give a very personal example of, for me. Uh, that uh, I, I spoke about, uh, that, that, you know, for me, I struggled with overeating. And in my first analysis, it was all talking about it in terms of the oral drive. And it turns out it had nothing to do with that. It had to do with something else and a completely different drive. So I think the, the, the mistake you can make, I think, in practice is thinking, you know, well, feces, it has to do with anal drive. It may, may not have to do with that at all. And I think one of the interesting things, if we look at the late Lacan, uh, speaking of the anal drive, which is often linked to the obsessional, uh, uh, you know, the anal drive and, you know, the preoccupation with thought and things like that, that you think of as the kind of classical Freudian description of obsessional neurosis, there's this wonderful comment from Lacan in Seminar 23 that's been developed by uh, Jacques Alain and by Eric Laurent, where the issue often in the, with the obsessional uh, neurosis is to tear the obsessional away from the, his uh, fascination with the gaze, you know, which is, you know, not 
which is a very different way of thinking about it. So for me, uh, I mean, it's an interesting question, uh, but I would want to talk with somebody who's interested in watching such live streams, and then you know you could figure out what it's about. So. Thank you. A second question by Marina. We are accustomed to say that every human being displays both male and female instincts, attributes. Could you comment in association with Seminar 20 and Co, a love letter and man and woman, woman's formula? We, we will need like a, <laughs> maybe <laughs> a year seminar or two. <laughs> uh, yeah, it would be a big comment, but I think in, in this regard, Freud, and I agree with Gustavo, and let me, let me just add, uh, lest I don't want to be my comments <laughs> to be taken the wrong way. Freud is absolutely essential for a psychoanalyst. I mean, you have to read Freud and and, and know Freud to a certain extent. Uh, and it's, uh, it would be, uh, it would be, uh, I think, very difficult to read Lacan if you did not have, uh, had not read Freud uh, first. Um, and I agree with the comments made about uh, about the subject, but uh, you know when I I find that this uh, uh, notion of Freud's about the, I think he said the essential bisexuality for of the human experience is picked up by uh, Lacan and uh, who's 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 who you you could say maybe in a sense was able to see even further than Freud about the direction maybe where this was going. These are, you could think of them to use in the, I mean, to give a very simple answer, you could um, think of male and female to use this term we used to, we use sometimes as a semblant. It's a, it's a, it's a little fiction we make uh, uh, that uh, uh, can be very fluid, but at the same time, I think what Lacan was interested was trying to determine if there was some way you could also describe it as a logic that had some connection, say, with the jouissance or the different ways of approaching the real or something like that. And that that's a very, very different matter. So there's two, there's two ways I think I would uh, approach the answer, which I'm not going to elaborate on now because Florencia is right. It would be a long discussion. But one would be to think of it from the standpoint of a of a saint dome, uh, 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 a way, a, a kind of logic way of taking hold of the real way of, of dealing with jouissance. And the other would be at the level of a semblant or a kind of uh, a fiction that one would uh, make of oneself. Um, okay. I think Freud, Freud recognized the problem uh, in the quote that I gave from the footnote in Lacan, uh, uh, Lacan, uh, develop some interesting ways of, of approaching the problem. So. The next question comes from Rick um, Lose in Dublin, whom you know and whom you've had in, in that corner of the world where you live. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Rick asks, Freud believed in the progress of science and in a sense, as you mentioned, also in the sexual rapport. However, is this not in a way contradicted, which I think is also part of Freud's way of thinking by the second last sentence on page 105? That second last sentence on page 105 says, one is probably justified in assuming that its importance as a source of feeling of happiness and therefore in the fulfillment of our aim in life has sensibly diminished. Talking about, yep. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's not just in this, and then one following maybe was the one he was alluding to now, and then one seems to realize that it is not just the pressure of civilization, but something inherent in the function itself That's that denies us total satisfaction. Yeah, yeah. And that's the sentence that uh, Gustavo alluded to as well in his comment. Um, I would agree. And I think to pick up maybe on Gustavo's comment, Rick's question, and also to say a thing about what Raphael said. Um, it seems to me, uh, it seems to me that uh, 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 um, 
Freud, I don't know that Freud's position on science wavered. I would say that Freud's belief, perhaps in progress, certainly changed over the course of his, his, his life. Uh, the, the, the Freud, I believe, is um, um, probably more pessimistic later in his life and in his practice than he was at the beginning. Uh, there was a, a moment, you know, if, if you think about it in terms of the, the history of psychoanalysis, I think there was a moment where when Freud believed that if you could release the repressed, you, you might say, if you could decipher the symptom and release the repressed and allow it to get it out in the open, uh, that a psychoanalysis would have positive effects. And, and there was an optimism early in his practice that got uh, tampered down over the course of, I don't know, a, a decade or something, and led in part to uh, beyond the pleasure principle. Mm. So I would say uh, about psychoanalysis itself, Freud became gradually more pessimistic uh, with time. About I, I uh, want to come back in here, Thomas, if, if, if I yeah. could, if, yeah, yeah. if that's all right. Um, so we're talking about, in a sense, differences between Freud and Lacan. And at a certain point in Freud's work, he says the following. When we study reactions to early traumas, we are quite often surprised to find that they are not strictly limited to what the subject himself has really experienced but diverge from it in a way which fits in much better with the model of a phylogenetic event and in general can only be explained by such an influence. The behavior of neurotic children towards their parents in the Oedipus and castration complex abounds in such reactions, which seem unjustified in the individual case and only become intelligible phylogenetically by their connection with the experience of early generations earlier generations so you see this is why i love freud he questions his whole his own theory a whole lot yeah. of it and says it's not hanging together for me i need i need something else here and this is the point of the trauma that lacan comes to when we're talking about the castration complex where we're talking then what is this phylogenetic, this phylogenetic event well in in lacanian parlance we're talking about castration as a facet of language so each one is subject to this facet, but in terms of singularity, in terms of the effect of it, is the production of a singularity in respect to the Freudian symptom, which is already a linguistic construct, in relation to the body and in relation to what Lacan will come to talk about in terms of the body as an enjoying substance, uh, which is not at all the same as a theory about repression and drive. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Raphael. Um, there's a question by um, DiBio or DiBio, I don't know uh, how to pronounce it. Um, a question that has bothered me for a while. The olfactory orifice is the only one in the body that is not associated with a drive oral, anal, genital, scopic, or invocatory. Along with the auditory, it's the only other orifice which cannot be closed by the body. After listening to Raphael read this chapter where the olfactory is elevated to an originary place, I wonder if this is more than arbitrary, mere oversight on Freud and Lacan's part. Very interesting question. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is an interesting, I, I like that question. I would say, I, you know, I, I occasionally will hear people talk about smells, mm -hmm. um, but not that often. I mean, so if you think about in your practice, do, 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 is it something we encounter often? I, I've encountered it and uh, uh, I, uh, you know, I'd never thought of sort of theorizing the issue. I guess one response that I would have would be that um, depending on, you know, if, if the oral drive is strictly conceptualized from the perspective of nurture and eating and, and intake and whatnot, 
you know, the, the everything having to do with taste associated with the oral drive is largely olfactory. I mean, because we don't taste in the mouth, we taste in the nose. I mean, the only, the only thing you sense, you know, in the mouth itself is sweetness and, and acidity and uh, I think salinity and so forth. I mean, there's a few things that there are sensed in the tongue, but uh, everything else has to do with uh, the retronasal passage. Uh, uh, but, you know, it, it's not something that I uh, seem to have encountered that much in my practice. I'd be curious about others. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I can think of at least one case presentation I've heard a long time ago that was entirely built around um, the, some olfactory symptoms associated with, uh, with, uh, with an analysand. And, you know, honestly, I don't remember the details other than the fact uh, that the person who presented it offered some kind of hypothesis about this. So. Mm. But it's, it's very interesting, uh, for example, how it's taken. I don't know if you've seen, obviously, everything is taken in the uh, classification and invention of new um, allegedly medical categories and you can see this in this awful TV programs you know that uh, have uh, been um, there for the last 10 years mostly uh, would have to do with you know building a TV program around this uh, kind of phenomena whether it's uh, things that people do with their bodies or with, with their houses or with and and um, in the medical uh, sphere there there's been a proliferation of diagnosis of newly invented if you like um conditions that mm. have to do notably with subjective experiences with regards to the senses mm -hmm. and and that's it it's not i agree with you thomas this is not our clinic this okay. is not to go back to the to the point we don't build psychoanalysis on this um uh, modifications of general discourses but uh, we nevertheless take them into account and we are very attentive to how to put it in in Lacan's terms in seminar 19 how bodies are captured by discourse hmm? Hmm. and um, also uh, in in relation to that uh, I, uh, let me think one thing real quickly. Gustavo is right. I can think of some schizophrenics I've taken care of over the years who've talked about their mm -hmm. their uh, the some sometimes the things they uh, they smell. He's right. Uh, it's, mm. boy, this was a, from a long time ago. So. Yeah, but but it, it's it's again because for us the body is not a given, and the mm. experience that a, a speaking being can construct with regards to his body, it's not enough to have organs for them to be organs and et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I was very, very flabbergasted by some, some um, consequences to, to try to illustrate this. The consequences that the alleged scientific discoveries or announcement, which 99% of the times are stupid uh, by science, you know, this new study discovered this and this, the, either they are complete tautologies that, you know, the headline is Harvard study demonstrate that early experiences are important for the future, you know, things like that. Or they're very quite uh, amusing. For example, uh, the effect that the discover this announcement of um, men's balls, sorry, testicles, have taste buds. Hmm? So what, what that produced uh, was a, a string of um, YouTubers and people that live their lives, you know, in this TikTok or I don't know what this worlds are, uh, by um, men uh, dipping their testicles in uh, food, uh, notably peanut butter for some reason, <laughs> and uh, to, to verify this. So you see, you have something that comes as a, as, as a as a discovery as a, as a scientifically structured uh, 
uh, discourse and then how that is taken up and of course uh, we can't speak to that in the way that we build our clinic from the singular speech of each analysand but thought it was interesting i lost complete track of where we are um neus carbonel um says to my understanding smells form part of the anal drive it's present often in the clinic of psychosis but also in hysteria um john has the hand up john do uh, linda can we open the mic sorry i'm trying to follow some of the um, uh, yes John? It looks like he's muted. Yeah, we will have to unmute him. It won't allow me to unmute him. Okay. Well, John, if you want to say something, you have to unmute yourself. And um, Joanne has made a few remarks as well. Linda, do we have anybody else with a raised hand? Yolka comments that the sensory disorders are very commonly diagnosed as such in the case of autistic children. They more and more tend to consider them as olfactive and other sensory disorders. Um, I think perhaps we can open the mic uh, to Neus as well there because this would be an aspect of the clinic that she would um, for sure have something to contribute to. Um, definitely, I hadn't thought of this. Uh, I, I really thank all participants for taking this angle with your comments because it's true that in the, the, the so-called epidemic of diagnosis of autistic spectrum and in the therapies proposed for them, uh, the question of the senses and the you know sensory uh, experience is um, is at the foreground um, and in in a way the question would be whether this way of thinking about the body in terms of the drives with freud i'm sticking to this uh, text that we're working on um can can be useful for something in that respect Neus, hello Hi, Neil. Hi. Thank you, uh, Thomas, for your uh, talk today. And thank you, Raphael, for the reading. It's really uh, very, very, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say interesting. I would like to find a better word than interesting to define uh, today's talk. Um, it's true that uh, autistic children uh, smell a lot. You can see them smelling objects, their own hands. Uh, even uh, I can think of, for instance, autistic children that play with tablets. And the first, day, the first thing they do when they get the tablet is to smell it. Mm -hmm. But um, also in autism, we don't find the drive uh, constructed as such because uh, we don't have really the, 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 the circuit uh, right, the uh, is how you call it, Florencia in English, circuito. The circuit. The circuit. I say it right. We don't find the circuit of the drive in in, in autism, um, but um, but uh, there is a certain. I find in autism that there is almost a certain identity between the smell and the oral, uh, and anal and the oral. Um, that's why I, I said that the smell, uh, to my understanding, the way I understood it, is part of the anal uh, jouissance. Um, so, 
yeah, uh, I think that uh, um, it is uh, wrong as it happens, and Florencia was saying it, to think of uh, sensory disorders uh, when we find, when we talk about autism the way uh, now you know uh, it's uh, it's defined, and we need to see it in the whole spectrum of how uh, the autism can not only deal with their own bodies, but also with uh, what has not been built mm -hmm. uh, in terms of body and how uh, the smell, the taste, the uh, um, the uh, sphincter control, uh, it's uh, always a problem because uh, the object cannot go through a circuit. Um, well, this is, uh, but uh, of course, it forms part of the body and the jouissance of the body and not part of a sensory disorders. To see well, this, yeah, yeah. 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 And it would it, Naos, I have a question uh, about that. Would it make would it also align with this phenomenon that the uh, uh, that the uh, of the you know the the schizophrenics that I can remember from a long time ago in the hospital? Some of them had, you know, we would think of them as olfactory hallucinations. I mean, they would yes. have they would mm -hmm. have these olfactory experiences that functioned like hallucinations. They they, mm -hmm. they were something of the real that uh, wasn't, uh, you know, uh, uh, contained in any way. But, uh, uh, and I remember seeing this maybe just a couple times, that these would be, you know, very, these were generally people in the midst of a psychosis. And, and it was a very troubling experience for them. But, but uh, Raphael was, had made the point before that uh, the, the smell takes on its significance in relation to either the real or the other. And, and then you have a way to organize this according to whether a circuit for the drive has been constructed or not, which in a way topologically allows us to show very well how the question of what do we build psychoanalysis on today is not separate from the question of how does each subject build his own experience as a subject and, as, and, and, and his world um, what does he build it on? So mm -hmm. I think um, I think this has been a, a, a really, really wonderful meeting. I want to thank everybody and um, especially Tom and Raphael. Thank you so much um, for your work today and for sharing um, your reading, your experience. Uh, thank you to everybody who was there. Um, it's great to have you. We are halfway through this seminar, believe it or not. Uh, this is our fourth meeting um, of eight. Next week, we will welcome Susan McFeely and uh, Roger Litton. And I would like to maybe say goodbye um, taking note of a very important question by Aino um, and uh, underlined by Alastair about love. And I hope that we can speak mm. a little bit more to that next week. Um, thank you and see you next Saturday. <laughs>